Hi, and welcome back to another Daily Dose of Anime Recaps. In this episode, we'll be covering the manga The World After the End. Once upon a time, Jay Wan was just your average Joe, innocently buying a bag of chips from his local corner store. Suddenly, bam! Mysterious towers appeared all over the world, and before he knew it, he was whisked away to battle terrifying monsters through 100 levels, each with a big boss waiting at the end. But after all that hard work and countless near-death experiences, Jay Wan realized that the whole tower thing was just a cruel hoax. Apparently, humanity was still alive and well, and the world hadn't ended like he thought. So he decided to turn his anger toward the twisted people who created this elaborate scheme in the first place. In the middle of the city, a ginormous tower appears out of nowhere, and people start freaking out, calling it the end of the world tower. Suddenly, some powerful folks, the Tower Walkers, are summoned to battle monsters in the tower to save humanity. During their journey, they stumble upon a nifty time-traveling stone called the Return Stone. One of the walkers uses it and disappears into thin air, leaving everyone else confused. Eventually, most of the walkers use it to save their skins. When one of the last walkers return back, only Yoon Wan and Jae Wan are left to battle the remaining monsters. They proceed to the next levels until Yoon Wan ends up dying in front of his mate, leaving Jae Wan all alone. What will happen to the present now that they are all gone? Jae Wan refuses to succumb to the fear and goes on to other levels as a one-man army. Eventually, he reaches the 99th floor, where the boss monster calls him an incredible human being for reaching this floor, where no other human has reached alone ever since the creation of the tower. Jae Wan does not want to return to the past and decides to continue to climb the tower. He isn't aware that someone is watching him through his journey, ready to harvest a valuable product this time around. Picture this. A guy is grabbing snacks from the shelves of a store when the ground starts shaking like a Polaroid picture. A little girl accuses him of stealing, but before he can defend himself, an earthquake strikes and a tower appears out of nowhere. Talk about bad timing. This tower has appeared in the cities of every country in the world, and people have started calling it the Tower of Nightmares. This tower has started sending summons to the people, and it's up to them to accept this position as a tower walker. The people who jump into the battle after accepting these summons receive the blessing of the interface system, which enables them to obtain items and skills as if it is a game. However, they soon realize that it isn't all fun and games. One day, people hear the announcement that a tower impact will take place in their world shortly, while some of them spot a person outside the tower. The tower impact strikes and a sea of monsters attack all humans which wipe out a third of the world's population. The people in the tower have no choice but to watch this massacre happen. This is when another summon appears where certain people are chosen as tower walkers to save the world. Of course, no one wants to let the chance of saving the world slip through their hands, and they all decide to climb the tower. These people with special powers are the last hope of humanity, which is why the walkers start to raid the tower. They continue to climb up the levels until they reach a dead end. They don't know how to destroy this hurdle since there's no way violence might work. When one of them tries to strike it down, their eyes fall on a shiny stone. They are informed that it is a return stone which can be used to go back in the past. Captain Inchon decides to use this stone so he can tell his teammates what it's like after using it. He disappears soon after using it, but can he come back? Sakamoto, who is a former science professor, steps in to deduce that the captain may not be able to meet them again since a part of the current timeline is split up. His scientific theories obviously leave the rest of the walkers confused, so he simplifies it to tell them that the captain has indeed returned to the past, but it doesn't mean that anything in their world has changed. During this time, the second tower impact has occurred in the world outside of the tower, and the walkers have to make a decision before the whole of humanity is killed. Are they going to use the stone and return to the past, or will they remain in the tower and die? As the monsters get more brutal, most of the walkers choose to use the stone and go back to the past, but there's a group of fearless walkers who don't need no return stone and their humanity's last do-or-die squad. In the end, it's up to the walkers to decide whether to use the stone and try to change the past or stay in the tower and fight to the bitter end. Decisions, decisions. Day One is feeling like a real badass after defeating a monster with his squad and getting a sweet new weapon called the Suppressing Dragon Sword. 
He thinks they might actually have a shot of reaching the final floor without any casualties, but of course, things can never be that easy. On the 98th floor, they're faced with a monster that takes out most of the squad, leaving Jay Wan and Yoon Wan to fight alone. Jay Wan is about to lose all hope when Yoon Wan tells him to snap out of it. It's like the classic, you got this bro moment, but with more monster fighting. Jay Wan channels all his anger and frustration to take down the monster and save Yoon Wan, but he's left feeling a little shook when he sees his friend in such bad shape. He can't handle seeing the smile knight without his signature grin. After telling Yoon Wan to take care of himself, Jay Wan bravely marches forward to the next floor, only to be greeted with a snowfield. Maybe he should have packed some hot cocoa instead of just a sword. Jay Wan trudges through the snowfield and comes face to face with an ice dragon who asks if he's given up yet. Well, Jay Wan's not going to back down from a challenge, so he's not about to let some frozen lizard scare him off. Unfortunately, things take a painful turn when he ends up hiding in a cave, trying not to scream in agony. He's not sure if this is some twisted game of hide and seek, but he's definitely not having fun. It turns out it's been 10 years since Jay Wan made it to the 99th floor, where the danger level is off the charts. He's only survived this long thanks to some abandoned equipment he found lying around. Hey, one man's trash is another man's treasure, right? He is too overwhelmed at this point and starts remembering Han si Ol's face, wishing that he was much stronger. In the flashback, Jay Wan is in Adipose talking to the blacksmith, Jay about his confidence of beating a monster this time around. The village of Adipose had been reclaimed, and the people there were determined to keep fighting no matter what. The priest had set up rescue teams and the blacksmiths were crafting equipment for the walkers for free. But now, it seems like Jay Wan is Jay's only customer. Jay's running low on supplies and nobody's coming to the lower floors anymore. It's like the whole world outside the tower has vanished or something. Despite all this, Jay Wan is determined to learn the blacksmith's skill and he asks Jay to teach him. Back in the present, the Ice Dragon recognizes Jay Wan's strength and bravery, which puts a smile on our hero's face. He's ready to take on the monster, and he notices some cracks in its armor. Looks like the fight's about to get interesting. Jay Wan has decided to fight till the end. While the Ice Dragon is quite strong and has injured him to the extremes, making him fall to the ground, he doesn't give up and thrusts at the monster, making it mock his lack of skill. Jay Wan started raiding the tower later than other people, because of which he missed things like hidden skills and classes every single time. That's why he gave up on other skills and focused on the thrust. It obviously worked well for him as he managed to kill 50 million monsters with his skill. His thrust skill has surpassed a simple skill now, and has started to gain attack power comparable to a hidden skill. However, he has only managed to scratch the dragon after a hundred thrusts at this point. It's too late for him to dodge until he sees the light that he saw on the 98th floor. He gets his chance and thrusts at the dragon once again, making it even more angry. The dragon is now ready to finish him off for good this time, and attacks him more from mid-air, decreasing his chances at winning. He would have definitely been able to defeat it if he had 10 more humans like him, but the dragon knows that his comrades were fooled by the mare stone. Jay Wan quickly goes out the door before the ice dragon finishes him off, wondering why the monster called the stone Mare Stone. Five years later, Jay Wan sits on top of the defeated ice dragon, asking him about the Mare Stone. The dragon dies after revealing that he will learn everything on the last floor, leaving the ice dragon sword behind for Jay Wan. He finds the floor to the next level, entering the last floor finally. Jay Wan finally reaches the last floor of the tower and is greeted with a display of the entire tower on multiple screens. Suddenly, a mysterious voice interrupts his sightseeing, advising him to relax and enjoy the rest of the show. A message pops up congratulating him for completing all the tutorial games and saving his records for the monarchs of the Almighty Land. Jay Wan is confused, wondering if he just spent his entire life in a tutorial. It's like finding out that the last 10 years of your life were just a dream. The voice belongs to a demon named Beast Train, who reveals himself as the master of the Tower of Nightmares. He shows Jay Wan a replay of his journey from the beginning, complete with commentary. Unfortunately, the replay includes the deaths of Jay Wan's friends, Yoon Wan and Su Yul. It's a sad reminder that life is fragile and can end at any moment. Cue the waterworks. Beast Train offers Jay Wan a chance to start the game all over again, but Jay Wan declines. He's not interested in going back in time. Beast Train reveals that the Mare Stone, which was the source of humans' obsession with time travel, was just a trap. Therefore, Jay Wan decides to move forward and hunt down Beast Train. 
Beast Train tells J1 that there are no more floors in the tower, but J1 is not buying it anymore. The demon tries to lure him with gifts like hidden items and skills, but J1 is determined to attack him. After 72 attempts, J1 finally manages to injure Beast Train, but the demon is still alive and kicking. Beast Train then goes on to explain that J1 is a special product that he wants to sell. Apparently, J1 has gone through a primary process of culling undesirable seeds, but he refuses to move on to the secondary process, which is causing Beast Train a lot of frustration. J1 attacks Beast Train again, but this time he manages to get him to sit down and answer some questions. Beast Train explains that there are countless dimensions branching out from the Almighty Land, and Earth happens to be the 294th world. Walkers in the tower can work on their status to adapt to the system of the Almighty Land and earn a chance to travel to a new world. Demons like Beast Train have a supporting role in the game, but J1 still doesn't believe him and calls out his bullshit. After defeating the Ice Dragon, J1 found himself in a hallucination, surrounded by fine particles and jagged sugar cubes. This is how he got to know that they were the essence of the world. In his conversation with Beast Train, he learns that the Almighty Land has monarchs who rule the place, and they only accept the top players in their forces. Beast Train promises to guide him to a great monarch. Sounding like a sleazy insurance salesperson trying to make a sale, J1 agrees to leave in 10 days and Beast Train curses himself for buying this ancient power, poor demon. On the last day, Beast Train presents J1 with an offer to accept the real game, but J1 brings out his weapon instead, ready to hunt him again. Maybe the hallucination was giving him a new sense of being alive, or maybe he just enjoys beating up demons. Beast Train plans to capture J1 in the breeding plant of the 92nd floor until the main game starts, but J1 reveals his personal information, including his nickname, Gentleman of Kaholmut, and his age of 784 years old. His plans of handing J1 over to the Harvester, called the Jet Black Monarch, are also revealed. Leaving the demon extremely shocked, this human is not supposed to know all these things. They once had it as Beast Train's pet project, so he breaks free from his breeding plant prison, leaving the demon flabbergasted. He starts questioning his reality since reaching the 100th floor, wondering if it's all just a mare's dream. But now, he's achieved a deeper understanding, and Beast Train reveals his true colors by saying that he won't go easy on him anymore. When were you ever going easy? As the countdown reaches 10 billion, J1 goes all out on the demon, and Beast Train can't keep up. He tells him that humans aren't just pawns to be traded and bartered. J1's had enough of following the script and decides to smash this joint and climb to the next level. Beast Train begs him to stop since there's no such thing as the next level, but J1 ain't buying it. He's seen the script scribbles of Molar, the tower's creator, and knows there's more to this illusion tree than meets the eye. So, he demolishes the whole tower while Beast Train sobs uncontrollably, ending the tutorial game once and for all. Soon enough, J1 wakes up surrounded by trees, happy to have finally found the trunk of this tree. J1 encounters a weak monster in the woods and cuts it down like a piece of cake. Suddenly, a group of antennae wearing green people appear and demand the horn he's carrying. J1 tries to make a deal, but they attack him instead. Talk about not being able to take a hint. After defeating them, he interrogates one of them. The guy would rather die than give up any information. So J1 yanks out his antenna and the dude pulls a tongue twister and dies. But J1 does find a cool backpack that can hold all his stuff, including spirit stones that can power up his adapter energy. Score! Plus, he finds a map to a place called Chaos that Beast Train didn't mention. That scammer. He sees a group of adventurers struggling to fight a monster, but J1 easily takes it down. The red-haired girl in the group asks him where he's from, and he answers with a mysterious chaos that leaves her scratching her head. Seriously though, how did these guys even clear the tower with their skills? J1 has found himself in a sticky situation with the Red Fox Clan. They're not buying his passerby story and are suspicious of his spirit power level. Meanwhile, the fiery red-haired girl Mino is ready to tear him apart for not answering her questions. He simply tells her that he doesn't remember anything, which makes her even more angry as she's not ready to believe that he has amnesia. To make matters worse, Mino finds out that J1 has a powerful spirit weapon and thinks he only defeated the Bihorn because of it. She's not happy that he did her dirty work for her. She wants him to kill the guys in the party since they will definitely go after him. He thinks about it while the party decides to rest in one place for the night. The guys in the party find out that J1's spirit power is low, 
making it obvious to Jay Wan that they are up to no good. They start coming towards him soon, but he is too relaxed for someone who doesn't even have his spirit weapon with him right now, making Mino too freaked out for him. The party surrounds both of them and attacks at once, causing Mino to reveal her true abilities. She starts striking them down one by one, swearing to make them suffer a terrible fate. The Red Fox leader calls Mino the Witch of Massacre. After he sees her kill all of his men, he had his suspicions when she lured the monsters to them, but had decided to keep it quiet. She belongs to the Dark Forest Clan and has been sent there to kill this party as they have killed many unknowing non-adapters throughout chaos. The leader is too smug, declaring that she will surely die here. He hasn't learned his lesson yet, though. He's putting all his trust on Jay Wan's spirit weapon, apparently, which is his insurance plan. But he has also called for backup from his clan, who have started arriving now. They have gathered half of the Red Fox just to hunt her and Jay Wan, which looks like overkill. Mino believes that she can defeat the Black Fox in one-on-one -on -one combat, but she can't obviously defend Jay Wan in the meantime. Therefore, she gives him the Mare's Stone, ordering him to run away. Jay Wan figures that this stone is not for going back to the past, but to save someone in the present only. He wonders what would have happened if Yoon Wan had this stone, instead of that useless stone. At this point, Mino also reveals that she will never return back to the past if she has a choice, as she really tries to do her best while living in the present. Hearing this, Jay Wan comes forward declaring that she will not die today. He takes out his weapon and starts slashing all the Red Fox men around with Fire King's 14 strikes, making them all too frightened to speak. Meanwhile, Mino, who previously thought Jay Wan is an idiot, is too amazed at his skills. She doesn't get a straight answer from him about his identity, though, and wants her return stone back. But of course, Jay Wan has lost the expensive stone, making her even more frustrated. She starts looking for the return stone while Jay Wan sits down peacefully, telling her that he is a human which makes him good enough to be trusted. Mino is feeling jealous of Jay Wan's memory loss as they arrive at the village near the Gorgon Fortress. The scene is chaotic with people begging for mercy and calling out to the gods. Mino warns Jay Wan not to ask how they got there because they are in chaos, the world of the dead. They are stopped by the security troops led by James, who orders them to line up for the speech hall. Mino tries to use her charms to get in, offering a buy horn's horn in exchange for entry, but James only lets her in and denies Jay Wan. Mino thinks Jay Wan will go berserk, but she steps in to prevent any trouble until the law-abiding Carlton arrives. He bans Jay Wan from entering due to lack of identification, and Mino is even more stressed because Carlton's special power is to make people obey the law. Jay Wan doesn't seem to be interested in following the rules, and when Carlton tries to restrain him, he breaks out of the chain, shocking everyone. He then tries to bribe Carlton with a spirit stone, just like Mino did with James, and Carlton reveals that he's been waiting for him calling him the Emissary of the Deer Whisperer. Looks like Jay Wan has found his match with Carlton's law-bending power, but at least he's got some bargaining chips up his sleeve. Mino's soul corruption has crossed the 15% limit, and apparently, it's a chronic illness that affects people in chaos and it slowly corrupts their soul. No wonder everyone's going bonkers over the Beast Horn, the only cure in town. Carlton, the lawman, examines Jay Wan to find that he's pure, which is quite rare around these parts. He even returns the spirit stone to Jay Wan, probably because he wants to keep his hands intact. The troops allow Jay Wan and Mino to enter the fortress, but Carlton warns them that only the Deer Whisperer can control the spirit stone. Jay Wan seems to fit the bill, but we'll have to wait and see what the higher ups decide. Meanwhile, Jay Wan and Mino were lost in the streets of the village. Mino still dazed from Carlton's law. Poor thing. Jay Wan just wants to find a blacksmith to fix his sword but he can't shake off Mino, who's following him like a lovesick puppy. Suddenly, a gang of thieves appears, demanding Jay Wan's azure sword. They even have a huge man with them that looks like he could chop a tree in half. Mino tries to talk them out of it, but the brute attacks her for being rude. Big mistake. Jay Wan swiftly dispatches him with a single stroke. The remaining thieves soon regret their life choices when they see Jay Wan's sword skills in action. Jay Wan has killed all of the thieves, revealing to Mino that he only knows how to do thrusts with his weapon. Jay Wan reveals that he blew up the roof while dealing with the other street thugs to scare someone who was using stealth skills across from them. 
which was getting on his nerves. Mino takes him to the blacksmith's shop of the mayor, which is also the biggest one in Gorgon, and they meet Navin, who tells him that the shop owner isn't there and only the deputy owner is inside. They watch while the deputy owner, Michael Garnard, deals with his customers, showing them the quad horn's horn. He challenges everyone to put a hole in the sword made from the quad horn to become the deputy owner of the shop for a day. Everyone starts trying their luck, but are unable to even put a scratch on it. Daywan volunteers to give it a try and shatters the quad horn with a single blow. This makes Garnard too furious at Jaywan since the quad horn is too expensive, so he has to offer a penna horn as compensation to him. Garnard accepts the horn since it's more valuable than his previous one, so he permits Jaywan to use the shop however he likes, as the place has the best facilities and artisans, while Mino leaves the shop to go somewhere else. Jaywan explains that he needs one sword sheath for his ice dragon sword making Garnard think that it's just a replica of an original one. However, he feels the spirit energy from the weapon, which contains the soul of a pretty high-class spirit, and observes the sword evolving into a new form. Once the spirit weapon goes through a great evolution, its original name disappears, so he has to come up with a new name for it. Someone tells the Gorgon Inner Fortress Minister, Chiver, that they lost the target after the street thugs were slaughtered, and he was gone after he woke up on the roof. Chiver wants Jay Wan to be brought to him, asking the fortress master to hang in there for a while longer. Meanwhile, everyone in the bar is watching a video that is very popular in Little Brother, which is the 99th floor solo clear. The monarchs seem to like the player a lot. While there are rumors that the tower received a cultivation suspension, it is quite ridiculous that someone is able to clear the tower alone. Mino walks into the bar and starts drinking a lot of liquor, complaining about Jay Wan to the bar owner, Claire, who has to stop her rambling, which is getting annoying. This is when she gets a letter from Carlton, and a person appears behind her who wants her to do something for him. On the other hand, Daywan and Garnard are in the midst of refining at the shop. However, Garnard is too afraid of the monster that is showing up out of the Ice Dragon Sword, not knowing how to work while this monster keeps bothering them. Garnard is exhausted and he can't keep working, since he can't even reach his tools anymore. Daywan has to make him keep working as it's important to be able to see, which is why he awakens the second stage of awakening in him to make him understand. Bernard can now see the true essence of the Pentahorn, and he can't believe that he has been using such trivial skills on the sheath. He transported to a world of monsters and dead people, making him think that it's all a dream. He can't understand how he entered such a world, and is honestly kind of losing his mind. Gernard is too old to handle Garnak's horns, but he knows that Jay Wan came to see the workshop owner, the mayor, and not him. He reveals that the owner has been away from the workshop, and the only available help left is a pathetic human like him. Jay Wan doesn't care about all these things, as he wants to just continue making the sheath, so he tells Gernard to try 10 billion times. He keeps motivating Gernard to fight against the norms and to rely on his own eyes. His efforts are eventually successful and the production is complete. It looks like Jay Wan is satisfied with the sheath, and Gernard names the sword Lone Wolf, which is an appropriate name for it. Mino is still following Jay Wan around like a lost puppy, which makes him a little doubtful about her ill intentions. Jay Wan reveals to her that he's going to meet the mayor and asks about the illusion trees to know how to get to the abyss. Additionally, he doesn't want to come back from the abyss if he does get there. She loses her mind after hearing this and starts calling him out on his selfish behavior and arrogant way of not treating those around him as humans. It's revealing that the man she met at the bar has told her to bring him back without trying anything funny in return for a hostage. However, she decides to part ways with him while a figure watches from the shadows talking about the mayor. This makes it obvious to Jay Wan that the mayor is with the guys who want him. Soon, Mino reaches back to the Forbidden Heaven clan leader, Janya, who is keeping her grandmother as a hostage. He doesn't look happy with her for coming back alone, but when has a witch ever kept her promise? She tells him that Jay Wan is not coming because he is going to destroy the world. The secret art of shadows attacked her, while the leader waits to find out if the Witch of Massacre can live up to her name. She threatens him with the name of the Dark Forest Clan, even though Janya's confidence is still intact. At this point, she doesn't have much choice left but to save her grandmother, so she attacks him with frozen blades, 
However, Janez stops her attacks easily, promising to tear her apart with his own hands. Just as he is about to strike her down, Jaywon shows up with his brooding face, making the clan members look pleased with his appearance, until he asks them to get the mayor to come there. It's obvious to the clan members that Jaywon is as crazy as the rumors say after hearing his demand to see the mayor. They think that he is just a reckless simpleton, so they decide to kill him right away. But Jaywon takes out his sword to fight them all at once. Of course, Janya manages to dodge his attack. Janya threatens to kill her grandmother once again, so Mino has to ask Jay Wan to save her. He is caught in an awkward position as he is just here for the mayor. Jay Wan breaks into the soundproof barrier, and his weapon's light is even seen by Carlton and his troops who decide to investigate further. Carlton arrives at the right time, and Jay Wan tells him that Janya is breaking the law that he loves so much. Carlton starts saying his little speech about the law, telling the clan members that they will all be arrested for breaking the law. He even tries to retrain them with chains, until Janya decides to fight him in one-on-one -on -one combat. Carlton strikes him down in a matter of seconds, though, making Janya surrender with chains all around him. Of course, he is lying and uses the Black Cloud to run away where they end up meeting the Forbidden Heaven Clan's elder, Sol Rong. They watch Jay Wan come out of the building with Mino, completely fine after inhaling the Black Cloud. Jay Wan soon finds the clan members waiting for him outside, which is quite annoying for him. Jay Wan brings out Granok's majesty to fight the clan this time, making everyone frightened of the monster that they can now see thanks to his weapon. Most of the clan members die in an instant, and Sul Rong runs away leaving Janya to deal with Jay Wan. Jay Wan asks Janya about the mayor's hiding place one more time. However, he knows that if he gives up this information then he's as good as dead. If he's going to die either way, Janya decides to eat the spirit stone that's in his mouth. Janya turns into a dead version of himself, which is basically a monster, surprising Jay Wan even more. Well, he decides to keep his feelings aside and strikes this new monster down with his sword, making him disappear entirely. Now, his next order of business is to find someone from the bar who knows the whereabouts of the mayor, really is obsessed. Mino is sick as usual, while Carlton wants to alert the fortress. When Jaywon reaches near Mino's sick body, he hears her asking to be killed while she is still herself. Jaywon decides to honor her request and kill her, until her grandmother Claire tells him to stop, as it might not be too late. They have taken Mino to a medical facility where chances of survival keep reducing, and they start hearing warning sounds about the appearance of a small dead in the fortress. All the residents start evacuating. They have no idea where to run off to since even the troops have turned into dead beings. Suddenly, the Demon Extermination Squad arrives, saving the lives of many residents of the fortress. On the other hand, Carlton is dying as well after inhaling the Dark Cloud, and even a Trihorn's horn is unable to fully stabilize him. Daywan tries to wake him up since he has a question, but finds Carlton asking to be killed as well. Aren't people supposed to ask for help in such situations? He even starts reading the laws one more time about the corrupt souls, making Jay Wan cringe at his useless loyalty. Well, he wouldn't have been stuck in that darn tower if there were more people like Carlton. Jay Wan is about to put a knife through Carlton's neck as his corruption stage has reached 94% until the Demon Exterminator squad captain, Jahire, arrives declaring that he will get rid of Carlton. Daywan is not going to let Jahire kill Carlton so easily, since he still has questions for him. Of course, he can't stop the blade of the captain with his bare hands and get away with it so easily. Jahire tells him that he needs to get rid of Carlton, but he can't let a stage 5 adapter like him turn into a dead being. Hearing this, Jaywan brings out Garnock's horn, which can help to bring back Carlton from a certain death. It obviously works out for Carlton. While Mino's deadification progresses quickly and her soul corruption rises to 95%, it can no longer be stopped, that's certain, according to the doctors. Tahire moves on to kill Mino while Claire tries to stop him, asking for the divine physician to perform a dead slash on her, which simply cuts away at the corruption. Hearing this, Jaywan steps in to kill Mino herself and enters into a strange world that has an old man which can be the origin of her soul corruption. 
corruption. He figures that she can survive if he kills the old man, who ends up stopping his normal slash. It turns out that the old man is the divine physician, Jung Hyo himself, who is cursing Jae Won for disrupting this dead slash since he has destroyed his sword. Jae Won is ready to lend him his new sword if he saves Mino, which seems quite foolish of him as he has met Jung Hyo for the first time. Chung Hyo and Jae Won enter into a strange world again, where the old man's spirit power starts lacking. Jae Won has to take matters into his own hands, which is a bit embarrassing for Chung Hyo, who tells him that it's foolish for him to think that he can copy his dead slash. However, Jae Won is wielding his sword to save another person's life for the first time in his life, so he decides to go ahead with the procedure. He tries to picture what Mino looks like in her personality, drawing her picture almost perfectly in the world. Soon, her corruption rate starts slowing down and the deadification seems to be stopping, leaving Jahire a little shocked. Mino looks alright now, while Chungyo tells Jahire that he used a dead thrust which means that he is awakened like the Divine Physician. Awakened are existences that lie outside the standard and the system's rules who are an extreme minority in humans and only get this strength after rejecting the system's adaptation. Jahire believes that they can save this Fortress Master. When the Dark Shadow Squad appears and their captain bows down before Jay Wan to pay his respects, he calls Jae Won the emissary of the Emerald Bug and takes him to the inner fortress where he finally meets the in charge of the internal matters of the Gorgon Fortress, Chiver. Jae Won denies being the emissary of the Emerald Bug during their conversation. However, Chung Gyo asks how he can use the spirit stones without getting his soul corrupted. He reveals that he has picked up the stones after killing their owners, who were the green antenna people called the Emerald Bug Clan. Chiver gets to know everything that happened to Jay Wan in detail since he came to Chaos, and his story is quite unbelievable for everyone listening. Of course, he has left certain key details out of the story. However, Chiver decides to trust him, asking if the body he has is a living one. Jay Wan thinks that his body is in a soul form, as he didn't go to the main game. There's a high chance that the illusion tree mistook him as dead and sent him to chaos. Of course, no one in chaos would have a living body since they all come here after dying, which is why Chiver knows that he isn't actually dead and is hiding the truth. Some people are calling him a hero, others see him as a crazy person. But is he a protagonist to Chiver? Does he think they are in a webtoon or something? He's being chased by a large power, according to Chiver who also happened to escape into chaos. It might be the monarch of pitch darkness, who knows? Chiver is ready to protect him in the fortress because then the monarch will become unable to interfere in the matters that occur within chaos. In return, Chiver just wants Jae Won to save the fortress master. Two hours later, Jae Won and Chung Yo are being escorted to the training room so they can decide whose thrust or slash is better to treat the fortress master. It looks like Chung Yo knows something about clearing the tower and is ready to answer all of Jae Won's questions if he manages to win against him. Obviously, Jae Won defeats the old man almost instantly, but he is not ready to accept his defeat. He wants a rematch to use his ultimate technique. Since he is 1,000 years old and is not ready to lose to a kid, Chung Gyo stands up and attacks Jae Won with anger, and it looks like a great face-off is in store for us. Jae Won is being pushed back a lot by Chung Gyo, even after using his normal thrust technique, which makes the old man laugh at the name of his technique. Therefore, Jae Won decides to use the Soul King of Chaos, making Chung Gyo remember the horror he experienced when he faced the king. His fear is real, so he ends up admitting defeat and the fight ends. On the other hand, in the fifth region of the Almighty Land, called the Region of Strong steel, where the monarch Hyo Yu gets to know that the monarch of pitch darkness is trying to contact chaos. Hyo Yu is a little surprised, since all the monarchs have already signed a secret treaty to not interfere with the matters of chaos. Of course, the matter is a little complicated, which becomes obvious after he sees the video of Jay Wan clearing the 99th floor, who is supposedly in contract with the 9th region's monarch of pitch darkness. Hyo Yu is even more shocked to learn that Jay Wan killed the cult Cultivator, Beast Train, and escaped to chaos after breaking the ceiling of the tower. 
He can't obviously stand by while pitch darkness is up to something in chaos, so he wants to help get access to chaos as well, in order to go there and observe what the hell is happening. Yo Yu wonders where Chung Yo is at the moment, while it's shown that the old man is getting beaten up by J1. He soon finds out that J1 carries a hostile energy toward their world and has become the thrust himself, who is thrusting towards the world every second. Now that he has won, J1 wants to know what is the master of the tower. Chung Yo reveals that the Tower of Nightmares is made by the mares, who have ranks from F to S. Some of the mares don't care about the ranks, though, since one master has made S rank towers when he was just an apprentice. Among them, there are towers with no intention to perform cultivation. However, no one knows the reason behind creating the towers as the masters just seek the world's truth. One thing's for sure though, the awakened appears occasionally among those who clear the tower of master. jung himself has come out of the fourth tower, which was known as the Moby Dick in the world, where a white whale would appear on the first floor and target humans every minute. The old man is amazed that Jay Wan has managed to clear Mola Molark's tower, since no one has been able to do so, and it turns out that he has even traveled with Molark. chung tells J1 that the original chaos was a blessed world where souls went to get a sweet rest after getting tired of the Almighty Land's war. However, in such a paradise, humans started to want the opposite as they missed the real life, which had death and began to act like they were living a real life. This life included eating, drinking alcohol, and having physical bodies with a beating heart, which was all pointless. However, one day, drunkards that started to do new things appeared with an expedition that dreamt of the impossible and gathered people together to rediscover real life, called the Abyss Expedition. They wanted to head to the Abyss to look for the fruit of resurrection, which were found on the branches of the illusion tree at the end of the Abyss. That fruit could really make the dead come back to life, and the expedition wanted to find that fruit. jung had already awakened at that time and was fearless while Mullark led the expedition. He was a really unique individual who met jung not believing that he managed to achieve and complete awakening without abandoning his emotions. jung was obviously upset about the cultivation and wanted to know why a mare wanted to go to the abyss when they were just supposed to co-op themselves in a room and create towers. It looked like Mullark regretted making towers though, and the reason he wanted to go to the abyss was because of the one tower that would end all cultivation. chung was only able to reach the entrance of the abyss because he fell behind on the way, but it seemed like Mullark reached the top of the illusion tree since fruits began to drop from the branches. Thanks to that, each of the expedition members were able to go back to chaos with arms full of fruits. Well then, why is this old man still here in chaos? It turns out that they only succeeded up to the part where they obtained the fruit since the monarch was waiting for them on their way back. There was an overwhelming difference of power, and during the battle, the fruit was stolen from them. They still used the fruits they had stolen to revive themselves each time they die for 900 years. At this point, jung passes out after drinking too much, leaving Jay wan to figure out that no one ever saw Mullock again after the expedition ended. This is why Jahir appears in panic, announcing that they've gotten into big trouble. Well, the trouble never ends in chaos anyway, right? Jaywan is running towards the fortress with Jahir, feeling the strange energy in the figures that the fortress master is indeed turning into a dead being. Apparently, the fortress master has gone berserk today. Jahir makes it clear that before his deadification, the master was a living legend. Since he was one of the few people who went on the Abyss expedition, he wants Jaywan to perform the dead slash this time to save the master. Jaywan is a little skeptical about doing the dead slash before perfecting it. However, they are soon stopped by the captains of the Disruption Tower and Despair Tower. It turns out that they are from the Forbidden Heaven Clan, who attacked Jahir, making fun of his skills. Jahir soon gets up on his feet and fights back, telling them to back off. Of course, the two captains do not fear the Fortress Master since he can't even control his own strength and distinguish between good and evil. The two continue to try and defeat Jahir, who is shocked to find them overpowering his Stage 5 adapter skills. Their growth is not normal and looks more like deadification. Something feels terribly wrong here. The two of them turn their attention to Jay Wan now and want to know if he can perform the dead slash since he looks too weak to them. Hearing this, Jay Wan starts throwing punches at them to prove that he is stronger than he looks. Men and their fragile egos, right? 
However, soon he starts feeling a stronger energy, which turns out to be the energy of fear that they want to use to betray everyone else. Saving the Fortress Master might be chung job, but jae Wan takes it upon themselves to kill the two right in front of him. Diver is confused about the Fortress Master's health, since it has been a day since the Dead Slash was used by chung -Gyo. The deadification and energy is supposed to have calmed down, but the Master has seriously gone berserk. On the other hand, chung -Gyo reveals that jae Wan's Dead Slash is just at the level of an imitation of his, and the Fortress Master's corruption is in grave state. A normal person would have definitely become dead by now. If they have another month, jae Wan's Dead Slash might actually work since two people performing the Slash will prove to be powerful. Meanwhile, Chiver thinks back to the time when the Fortress Master told him about the appearance of people who could control soul corruption and had decided personally to go and take a look himself. He is laying down almost as a dead being now since he got infected with soul corruption when he went to take a look around the outer fortresses. The outer administrator, Mayan's last resort is to use the Dead Seal, which can help them preserve preserve the Fortress Master's spirit power at the very least. This technique can be done by the help of Soul Stone and the Dark Shadow Squad captains bring out the Soul Stone box. Tyver is against this idea and believes them to all be traitors since the performance of the Dead Seal might lead to the Fortress Master's spirit power to be sealed in the Spirit Stone as it is. Anyone who gets a hold of the Spirit Stone then will end up inheriting his spirit power and can become the next Master of Gorgon. The stone can fall into the hands of some someone dangerous, like the outer administrator who surrounds Chiver with his traitor members. This is when the wall of fortress breaks down and jae Wan appears looking all heroic as he usually does. jae Wan tells Mai Han that his traitorous acts have already been exposed to the world. As the two captains he sent to stop jae Wan are dead now, the traitors try to restrain Jahir so the dead seal can proceed, while jae Wan makes a deal with Chiver saying that he will save the fortress master and kill all the traitors, and he only wants Chung Hyo in return. It looks like he wants to set up the Abyss expedition again, and he wants the Gorgon Fortress to help him with his plan. Mai Han hears this little exchange and figures that Jae Wan is the same person who killed Janyo with a single strike, so he decides to go all out against him, telling all of his traitor buddies to attack him at once. Jae Wan keeps striking the traitors down, so they come at him endlessly, but he keeps fighting them off with his normal thrust. Soon enough, my hand joins the fight and is about to be overpowered by Jay Wan when he stops blocking to save himself. The rest of the traitors decide to use the Black Cloud again. However, Jay Wan is not letting them go away so easily. He channels all his power with his new sword, striking them all down and is glad that guys like them make it easy for him to destroy the world. Tyver feels overwhelming hope from jae Wan's power, until he turns back to chung -Gyo and tries to wake him up by kicking him on the back. They need to get to work since the Fortress Master's soul corruption has just broken past 99% and how deadification has begun. Gorgon's automatic warning is activated while the Fortress Master is turning into a super huge dead. It causes a huge commotion amongst the people who begin to evacuate the village. The Fortress Master looks scary, while chung -Gyo and jae Wan prepare their weapons to perform their respective slash and thrust. chung -Gyo tries to remember good memories with the Master as those memories help avoid the worst. However, the old man soon finds out that something's very off here, and the person in front of them is not the Fortress Master. He is the Master of the Dead Palace that's in the middle of chaos, who is also the only one that's able to open the door leading to the Abyss, the Soul King, Catastrophe. Day One is so confused to see him look so similar to a dead, while the Soul King finds him too interesting for being a human that possesses a human's heart despite having completely awakened. The Soul King has definitely used his special power called Dead Descent on the Fortress Master's body, which makes him just a clone. How can a clone be so overwhelming? Day One wants to kill this being now making the old man too worried about him while the Soul King only laughs at his foolishness, since not even Malark can do anything against him. Daewon believes that he can do it and decides to give it his best shot. chung -Gyo spots the Void Sword in the Soul King's hand, which is the same fearful weapon that turned half of the expedition squad into dead in an instant. The Soul King knows that Daewon wants to go to the Abyss, telling him that he is too weak to take such a daunting journey. Daewon doesn't want to listen to his ramblings Though, and cuts his arm off, which looks like it's good news until the Soul King becomes even angrier. 
He slashes at J1 with the Void Sword, making a huge cut on his arm. It turns out that even a scratch from this sword is enough to make a person dead. However, J1 doesn't look worried and knows that he can rip the corrupted part of his soul away. Taking a closer look at him, the Soul King recognizes his sword as the replica from the Mare's Tower, which is just a toy for him. J1 is also aware that he won't be able to last if he keeps fighting like this, since he is still unable to see his weakness and his focus is interrupted by all the strange particles messing with his sight. He starts thinking about his unique world, the White World, since each awakened soul has their own unique world. He uses the Moon Eye to show this world to the Soul King and Chungyo, who are shocked that he has made a hellish world from loathing and anger. The annoying particles are finally gone, and Jaewon keeps charging at the Soul King without knowing how to end it. While the Soul King finds him really interesting, it is a pity that he has to end it when he is about to kill Jaewon with his massive sword. The fun might have been over for the Soul King, but J1 is just getting started, who slashes at him with his weapon. The King doesn't believe that he can even lay a scratch on him, taking him to a strange place where the two clash endlessly. The Soul King has watched beings try to build the world for millennia. However, he doesn't know what kind of answers J1 is looking for in this world. While he keeps on giving his speech on the world, Jaewon's motives and the existence of the illusion tree, Jaewon keeps on charging at him with his sword and is too injured. However, it doesn't look like he's going to give up. He has definitely experienced this situation before, so he keeps on testing his theories making the Soul King even more frustrated. When the king decides to end their little game, Jaewon becomes even more sure that he is connected to the main body of the Fortress Master since it's a clone, so he uses the technique of the crack. His attack makes the entire clone disappear out of existence, promising Jaewon that he will wait at the entrance that leads to the abyss. An extremely injured Jaewon decides that he needs to become stronger, since thrusting alone is insufficient. While the strong thrust may be good against numbers, it's not as effective against a strong individual because the damage radius is too wide. He knows that he was only able to use it this time to distract the Soul King and buy some time. It seems that he needs a new technique to deal with powerful individuals. Suddenly, he hears the Fortress Master thanking him since he was observing him the whole time. Maybe it's time for Gorgon to experience some changes, so he makes J1 the new Fortress Master. When J1 walks out, Shiver and everyone else falls down on their knees after seeing the pattern on his arm, paying respects to their new Fortress Master. Two days later, J1 refuses to become the Fortress Master since he doesn't have time to waste. His goal is to get to the Abyss. However, he can't even pass on the title to someone else as the pattern won't let him do it. Kyber keeps a huge stack of documents in front of him to go through and leaves. Soon, a magic paper starts congratulating J1 for becoming the 17th Fortress Master, who tells him all the obvious do's and don'ts of the position. Furthermore, it tells him not to become greedy or try to change anything. After listening to all these foolish rules, Jaewon tells Chiver that he's going to get rid of Gorgon's Fortress Master since the purpose of the forest will cease to exist if there are no enemies. The Fortress Master won't be needed in that case, so Jaewon is on a mission to unite chaos now. There aren't festivals in chaos, instead a ritual known as Soul Farewell Procession is held to send off those who have passed on. This might probably erase the dead. The name of the previous Fortress Master is finally revealed, which is Emil Grotesque, at his Soul Farewell. This is the name of the darn old man who made Jaewon the Fortress Master. He can hear all the whispers about him being too young to take on this position, which makes him look like he wants to kill them all. Suddenly, an old man from the Savant clan named John Lon comes up to Jay Wan to make some small talk and proceeds to ask him about his age. These people are too obsessed with his age, aren't they? There are also rumors that the new Fortress Master is a non-adapter, which is a great chance for Lon to take revenge for the humiliation he faced 10 years ago. Turns out that he wanted to set up a branch in Gorgon, but was rejected for trying to bribe the guards at the gate. This new Fortress Master clearly presents an opportunity from the heavens. This is when J1 starts acting weird because the highest level illusion skill takes him to eight gates of heaven after he shakes Ellen's hand. 
Illin is too evil for making him taste the hellfire of the Crimson Dragon in his illusions. He expects Jay Wan to have no choice but to listen to his orders. However, his trick fails as he comes out of his illusion. Now it's his turn to take Lon to his illusion world through his moon eye, showing him a different kind of hell. The old man can't take it for long and falls to his knees, begging for mercy in front of the new fortress master. Jay Wan decides to let his stupid trick slide this time, while everyone else in the procession watches with surprise. Now it's time for Jay Wan's inaugural speech, so he starts off by acknowledging that he knows people are not happy with him being the new fortress master, but he really doesn't care. Furthermore, he's ready to make anyone else a fortress master if they manage to defeat him in a one-on-one -on -one match. He's too smug for a 60-year-old. He gives him one month, and if the people fail in challenging him, he declares that all of them will become a part of the Abyss expedition that will depart two months later. Chiver surely believes in Jay Wan and accepts him as the fortress master even though he makes ridiculous declarations. He simply observes him as he challenges all the people, but he knows now the situation is getting out of control since a mob is waiting outside the inner fortress waiting to fight Jay Wan. Chiver angrily walks towards the fortress master's office and finds Carlton sitting there with Jay Wan nowhere in sight. Where the hell did he go? It turns out that he's gone to visit Chungyo to tell him he has created a new technique, showing him a preparation pose that is softer than usual. Of course, Chungyo wants to name it the Chungyo Thrust, as he believes that his new technique is a ripoff of his slash until Jay Wan shuts him up by attacking him. This is when they find the Lightning God clan leader, Yun Yang, lying on the floor. It turns out that just a few minutes earlier, Yun Yang entered the fortress to assassinate Jay Wan and got caught up in the attack that was meant for Chungyo. Yun Yang is soon defeated by Jay Wan, leaving the leader a bit shocked at the extremely mysterious man in front of him. However, he decides to stand up and fight again, and Jay Wan accepts the challenge happily. After a series of slashes and dodges, he gathers all of his energy to destroy him in one go, but ends up losing again when Jay Wan uses his new technique. Soon, Yun Yu comes back after spreading the rumor that he barely lost to the fortress leader. Jay Wan had asked him to do so since he wants a lot of strong people to start challenging him now. It's taken exactly 100 years for the Yun Wun clan to get where they are, and Yun Yang is one of the five members. However, he is a slave alongside the comrades that clear the tower with him. Most of his friends have either died or been sold for more gold and he is the only one who has miraculously survived. After gaining trust for 100 years, he officially becomes a servant until he decides to betray the trust and plunder the secret annual vault of the Yun Wun clan. This is how he steals the lightning gold art. He manages to learn this skill, making every single cell in his body much younger. Of course, he gets killed by the clan after being chased for 20 years and comes to chaos. He is able to become the ninth clan of 10 clans in 100 years, but he can't digest the fact that a guy like Jay Wan has become the fortress master of chaos. It actually doesn't make sense to him. Now that he is defeated by Jay Wan, Chungyo tells him that the Forbidden Heaven clan almost occupied Gorgon until Jay Wan saved Gorgon from collapsing, who wishes that he had known all this information before he came here to assassinate him. This is when the fire clan leader, Kang Wong, arrives to challenge the fortress master for a fight along with the Southern Sea Clan's leader. They want to take turns, however, Jay Wan tells them to come at him together since he is practicing his new technique. Well, he surely is full of confidence. Kang Wong attacks him, and the fire from his sword doesn't even scare Jay Wan one bit. Jay Wan uses his new thrust only once to send them flying out of the training ground, and as usual, it's hard for him to control his strength. Now it's his turn to fight the other clan leader, who didn't attack him with Wan, since he doesn't like fire. To be honest, only fools like fire. The Southern Sea Clan, K Wan's chosen element, seems to be water, which makes Jay Wan feel like he's being reminded of Pokemon. In any case, the challenger seems stronger than the other two. Something's different about this guy, as he's not charging recklessly at him, and he is keeping himself under control. Therefore, Jay Wan decides to make the first move and attack him, but his opponent moves out of the way. He accepts his defeat quite early on and wants to start talking about the Abyss Expedition, 
and he certainly came here with ulterior motives. Kang Wong is really mad at Yu Yang for lying about barely losing to Jae Won, but now he obviously doesn't have a choice and needs to join the Abyss expedition quietly. Kamen has come here with the intention of joining, so he obviously doesn't care. He wasn't able to join the previous Abyss expedition for not being strong enough, and had even witnessed the fall of the last expedition squad 900 years ago. Wong agrees to join as well, while Yu Yang runs away, but turns to bow down to Jae Won, swearing his complete loyalty to him. He wants to be accepted as his family member and promises not to steal any secret martial arts manuals from him. He also reveals that the Lightning God Clan no longer exists in chaos, since only seven people have survived. The Lightning God Clan was done about a week ago, and to summarize Yu Yang's situation, after losing quite pathetically to J1 and not having anywhere else to go, he wants to be accepted by them. Chungyo also ends up revealing that J1 saved Gorgon from the Forbidden Heaven Clan in front of Kamen and Wong, who were as shocked as Yu Yang was. The same clan is responsible for destroying Yu Wang's clan, along with a few other clans. This means that the Manacore Fortress has completely fallen to the Forbidden Heaven clan. This is why the news hasn't spread as the clan has gotten complete control over the skill system and has blocked the messaging system. They wish they had WhatsApp now, don't they? Jae Wan figures that the smaller the rank, the stronger they are. Yu Yang explains that there are four fortresses in a clan that Yu Yang explains that there are four fortresses in a clan that ruled over about 10 clans which are ranked from 1 to 10. The strongest one is the rank 1 clan while the weakest is rank 10. However, the forbidden clan which is at rank 10 has managed to somehow defeat the clans of the higher ranking. He is certain that someone's supporting them in all of this. Thinking back to the time he met the Forbidden Forest Clan, Jaywon wants to know if the mayor or the person Janya was afraid of are at the Manicore Fortress. In the meantime, the Forbidden Heaven Clan leader, Lim Jin Hong, is sitting on a throne in a fortress over the dead bodies of many people. Apparently, the Dark Forest Clan leader is still fighting the forces of the Forbidden Heaven Clan with his team, but it looks like it will be over soon. Lim finds out that Yu Yang has escaped. Manicor has probably run off to Gorgon and figures that the clans might join hands against them. He knows about the new fortress master who's betting his position to gather an expedition for the Abyss, not believing that someone in chaos still thinks like that. While they had less forces compared to Manicor, Mai Han has put a lot of effort into gathering the Foundation Stones, which makes him too ashamed to meet the Monarch of Pitch Darkness. He watches Jay Wan on a screen and his face looks kind of familiar to him, and it turns out that it's the message from the Monarch where he's asking Lim to find the runaway products. Why are they being asked to look for something they failed to manage, though? It makes even less sense when they think about it that some random product has escaped the chaos after destroying the tower. This makes Lin laugh, and he decides to leave Yu Yang and the other clan leaders alone, since Gorgon will soon be raised to the ground with the dead. He knows that the Soul King, Catastrophe's energy disappeared from Gorgon, but dead can summon other dead, and the people of Gorgon will soon find out why Catastrophe is known as a disaster. On the other hand, Wong figures that a monarch is probably backing up the Forbidden Heaven clan as he heard that the Almighty Land is currently having a war throughout its lands, and someone might be taking advantage of that to get involved with chaos. Damon suggests that they should try to contact the Resurrection Palace, where the monarchs and five clans revive, but he doesn't like the idea of asking for the monarch's help. It looks like a war is certain, while Chungyo tells Jay Wan that the Resurrection Palace is too strong for him to do at his current level. However, his words fall on deaf ears since it really doesn't matter to Jay Wan. Jay Wan tells Chungyo that he is going to join him in his crazy place, who doesn't look too happy with his suggestion. However, he doesn't have a choice in front of this kid, so he stays quiet. Jay Wan continues to tell the rest of the guys that he will first unite Chaos, then destroy the Resurrection Palace that stole the fruits 900 years ago before departing for the Abyss expedition. He needs true comrades who are willing to go through all of these stages with him, but he will do it alone if he doesn't find a squad. Kai Wan and Yu Yang rapidly decide to join him, while Wong stalls for a bit and isn't quite sure that Jay Wan is capable of leading the Abyss expedition. He wants Jay Wan to get acknowledged by three other clan leaders. He will trust him as well. Jay Wan agrees on one condition, that he will host the tournament of their titles as clan leaders on the line. If they make it to the quarterfinals, then he will acknowledge them as well. 
His idea does make sense since there's no proof that they are the strongest in Chaos either. It turns out that the tournament is starting right away, and all the strong people in Chaos and spectators have flocked to Gorgon to watch them. Each inspection gate is having problems confirming identities as Carlton reveals, and j Wan's plans are only approved because he has appointed Carlton, Claire, and Jahir as tower leaders. The tournament is going to be held at the Northern Outer Fortress, where everything was destroyed because of the Forbidden Heaven Clan, and Claire declares that Gorgon will make a profit of $13.28 with this tournament. Chiber's disagreement with the tournament doesn't really make sense now, because surely he hasn't seen that kind of money in his entire life or after life. At the south of Chaos, where the Dryad Fortress is built by nature, the Fortress Master Aisha Lindcroft senses that something bad has happened. She uses her top-level skill to scout and finds one of the three great dead, backwards-walking Magrite, going towards Gorgon with the rest of its squad. She immediately decides to inform the Gorgon Fortress Master about this development. Back at the northern streets of Gorgon, the tournament is down to the pre-quarter finals within three days, and it's progressing pretty fast. This is when Chungyo meets Mag Gook, the limitless clan leader who has grown quite strong but hasn't participated in the competition. Meanwhile, Wang loses the match against a woman who is the subordinate of the Steel Monarch, Hyo Yu. The monarchs are up to something in this competition for sure. With this, the quarterfinals start right away as J1 is quite an impatient person, and the savant leader, Myung's turn finally comes, making the crowd go crazy. He is facing off against J1 himself, who sends him flying off to a wall with a single powerful thrust. His skills are getting better, aren't they? But he needs to stop showing off at this point. Myung didn't have an opponent listed in the quarterfinals at first, but was glad to find out that the Fortress Master himself was going to fight him. The only reason he joined the stupid tournament was to warn j Wan. after all. He is a pessimist and knows about the past when people got too hopeful after getting motivated to join the Abyss Expedition, and that hope turned into greater despair. He's not ready to admit defeat now, as he wants to crush the hope before people get too involved. We gotta give it to him. He is a tough one. Since he lost the fight to J1, he comes up with the idea to have a battle of wits with him and challenges J1 to accept his proposal. Well, it's only fair that they fight on his terms, right? However, he is no longer the crowd's favorite, and almost all of them want him to accept his pathetic defeat. Chingyo has figured out Myung's plan to play the game that military advisors play with J1. Of course, J1 isn't too scared and agrees to his terms. When Myung's to the military strategy formation world, which is just too much of a fancy name. Obviously, Myung is the best at this game in Chaos. The strategy game has its main scenario where there is supposed to be a war between three races, and they have to gather resources and train their troops in real time in order to destroy the enemy's buildings. J1 has obviously played a similar game over 10,000 times on Earth, so they start off right away. J1 chooses the human race, which is the weakest of all the races, while Myung is on the undead races side, which gets stronger with every level. Level. Myung already had a plan in mind to win the game easily, until j Wan's troops cut off his troop's head. Kudos to him for attacking right away. j Wan has already built three watchtowers in Myung's base, from where his troops are attacking while hiding inside. He has definitely put Myung in a tough spot, since he can't even gather more resources. Myung starts acting like a child after watching his strategy get crushed by a novice like j Wan, but eventually accepts his first defeat in over 400 years in front of this new kid. Chungyo needs to know how j Wan knows about the military strategy formation world, since he only spends his time practicing his thrust. Of course, he uses this opportunity to start naming j Wan's new technique, as he still thinks that it's inspired by his thrust. Therefore, with the help of k Wan, they have settled on the name Fatal Spiral, which sounds pretty badass. This is when j Wan's eyes land on Magook, who looks pretty strong, and his first instinct is to ask him for a round of one-on-one -on -one combat. He never does get enough violence. This makes Magook wonder how j Wan would compare to Millar, who led the Abyss expedition 900 years ago. He's seen him fight and knows that this kid is pretty strong, but his personality is the total opposite of Malark's, who was mature and gentle. Additionally, he feels a strange bloodlust from j Wan, which makes him realize that he isn't awakened. Do all awakened end up being this violent? Back to the tournament, it's time for the next quarterfinals match, when j Wan walks onto the ground as he doesn't want to waste more time. The three players in front of him look pretty strong 
apart from Cayman and Yu Yong, so he announces that all six of the participants will team up to fight against him alone. Furthermore, he promises that the first one to take him down will be the new Fortress Master. The crowd is going wild, as we feel after hearing this announcement, though. Jay Wan has made this decision to fight against the six competitors in order to gain the trust of everyone around him. And since there is a time crunch, and the only way he can do that is display overwhelming strength. However, the strong girl from earlier chooses to opt out of the competition since it's too troublesome and knows that something is going to appear anyway. What does she mean by that, though? Yu Yong and Kei Wan also give up, accepting that they don't stand a chance against the Fortress Master. They clearly want to save face at this point. The three remaining participants include the Priestess Clan's leader, Yu Rong, along with her Vice Clan leader, Captain Hu Yong. Jae Wan doesn't mind all of them attacking him together, but it turns out that they aren't there to fight with Jae Wan and only want to know his personality. They declare their intentions in front of him and end up voluntarily entering the Abyss Expedition. If they had been clear from the start, there wouldn't have even been a need for this long tournament. Yu Rong continues to commend Jae Wan for his method of selecting strong volunteers for the expedition through the tournament and uses her advanced skills to see through the inner thoughts of the audience. She addresses the audience, asking if they want a better future for chaos. When an old man named the Gentleman Sword Han Myung Wan speaks up, saying that he hasn't come here to just watch people fight with each other. Meanwhile, Jae Wan stands speechless on the ground, wondering what in the hell is even happening around him. Carlton is walking through the inner fortress when he enters the office to find a messenger eagle waiting, who tells him that the group of dead, including a mega dead, is approaching the Gorgon Fortress. It looks like the druid fortress master, Aisha's message has reached before it got too late. Meanwhile, Gyuk Rong is still giving a speech about working together and putting an end to the tournament, since many people are willing to risk their lives and join the Abyss Expedition. She continues to use her tricks to announce that she hopes Jay Wan will lead the expedition, as he has proven himself to be quite strong. It still looks like a scheme here, folks. She is interrupted by the gentleman's sword, Han, who wants to see if Jay Wan has a suitable personality to lead the Abyss Expedition, asking her to use the rightful audit on Jay Wan to determine if he is qualified for the role. Jung Yo is clearly not happy about this audit that she wants to perform on him. However, Jay Wan ends up agreeing to go through the test. Starting off with the audit, Jay Wan is transported to a ship in the ocean to the stage of the ocean region. The ship is sinking, and the rescue boat can only take 10 people according to the scenario. Jay Wan is the captain, who needs to decide if he's willing to give up one person or let everyone on the boat sink. This is a clear case of morality, and such a tough spot to be in. If Jay Wan chooses the first option, then someone will blame him for being heartless. But if he chooses the second option, then he'll be blamed for having poor judgment. This righteous audit does not have a right answer at all, it seems. However, Jay Wan knows how to get out of difficult situations, and he chooses option number three that doesn't even exist. He has made a third option for himself, which is to save everyone, as well as to not let the ship sink at all. Yuk Rong is surprised to see that he has found the hidden option that only appears when you look for your own answer. This choice allows him to get everyone to take turns to go into the water while waiting for the rescue team. Of course, Yuk Rong wanted to make him look incompetent by showing him two options, but her plan has failed. Jae Wan doesn't even take up her third option and decides to split the sea instead, while everyone looks completely scared. He ends up doing what he promised, and all the people are saved on the boat. Just when the righteous audit ends, the Gorgon territory is issued an order called Gorgon 1, which makes all the fortress gates locked while the residents are asked to evacuate to the North Street. It looks like the dead are finally approaching Gorgon, while Chungyo discusses a similar situation that happened 900 years ago with Magu. He is also aware of the phenomenon of the dead calling the other dead, and because of the Soul King, the Mega Dead have arrived in Gorgon to make it go through a huge disaster. This doesn't feel less than a horror movie for now. The dead are literally swarming Gorgon and attacking all the residents, which is making it look like this is surely the end for the entire fortress. There are so many dead in this army that even Han, the gentleman's sword, finds it hard to deal with them. The human side looks way too powerless in front of them. Gook Rong feels like giving up on life itself at this point. When Yu Yang knocks down a couple of dead in front of her, she really needs to get a grip as she thinks that fighting the dead is pointless and just a way to buy some time. On the other hand, Day Wan is fighting a way stronger dead all alone and manages to kill it with his fatal spiral, which is witnessed by everyone. Maybe watching him fight is giving hope to everyone around him as well. Another mega dead appears before him, who keeps biting off everything around whenever Jay Wan goes near him. He decides to put some distance between them and attacks it once again, but his moves are not hitting the right 
right place. Chungyo is also losing hope, since there's nothing they can do in the midst of such great despair. This is when he remembers the old fortress masters saying that people only need a ray of hope, and looks up to Jaewon defeating the Mega Dead with his deadly sword. Jaewon stands on top of the Mega Dead's corpse with his sword still inside it. It would have been better if he'd have tried this move at the beginning, right? He keeps on fighting the dead with a reckless attitude that works wonders, while the rest of the fighters also decide to protect his recklessness and join him with all their powers. Even Myung appears to assist them in this fight for the living. During all this intense fight, Yu Yang only cares about looking cool when he slashes his sword left and right at the dead, getting an underwhelming response from Wong. Later, Wong's body starts slowing down because of the fatigue from all the fighting and is about to give up when Carlton arrives to help with the glory of his silver chains. Fighting like this does feel so much better. Daewon decides to attack the core of the dead and uses his sword to light up the entire Gorgon fortress. Ten days pass and it's revealed that the humans did indeed manage to defeat all the mega dead in the battle. This piece of news has certainly got the whole of chaos quite excited. Living in Gorgon has become much nicer for the common people, since six of the ten great clans in chaos have moved the headquarters in the fortress. There is a huge increase in supplies as well, including the horns of the horned beast which has led to abnormal economic growth. One of the common people reveals to a reporter that Jaywon parted the whole sea of dead into two with his sword, which is now being termed as the Path of Waves, making everyone entirely bewitched. Seeing this, everyone fought the dead and many lives were lost. This is when the reporter hears a loud explosion, and he figures that high stage adapters are fighting with their spirit power to cause it. His theory is proven to be true when they find out that Jay Wan is training all the powerful clan leaders to fight, who still have a long way to go before they even think about reaching the Unfortress Master's level. Back at the Manicore Fortress, Lim is shocked to find out that the Mega Dead that marched on Gorgon have been exterminated, since it is quite impossible to defeat such a monster unless a lieutenant general or higher deals with it. Four days later, news of the North Branch of the Forbidden Heaven Clan that's near Gorgon being totally destroyed is spread. This is sure to leave Lim even more frustrated than before. Meanwhile, Jaywon is still training the clan leaders and is proving to be a pretty strict teacher. He insults each one of them over their weaknesses one by one, making all of them a little disappointed. He tells them that they all have one common problem, which is that they have obtained something without much effort, and even goes as far as to call Chungyo a weak old geezer. For the first time, Chungyo doesn't disagree with him, since he is aware that the members of the Abyss expedition were too strong 900 years ago, surpassing the level of a ninth stage adapter. Mullark was obviously stronger than everyone. However, Jaywon is not happy that most of his squad got greatly injured or nearly died when they attacked the North Branch of the Forbidden Heaven clan recently. He is worried about going to attack them in the Manicore Fortress, since their sorry state makes it obvious that they aren't fit to go for the Abyss expedition yet. Therefore, he decides that all of them will be undergoing special training for a week. Myung is a little confused to hear this, since he knows that adapters take years to get to the next stage. He figures that Jaywon is trying to turn them into Awaken, who are able to reach the next stage through a sudden enlightenment. Of course, Jaywon accepts that this is indeed his objective, asking them if they are ready to abandon their own world, since they need to destroy the world of adaptation that they have lived in so far. Hearing this, Kai Wan steps up ready to throw away his skills and his world except for the hatred that he has towards the monarchs. Duke Krong is not pleased with Kai Wan's decision because of the great disappearance where years ago a large group of adapters simply ceased to exist after the monarch presented them with a chance of being awakened. The small number of people that did manage to come back being awakened ended up taking their own lives as they went mad and lost their memories. This is surely not great motivation for them to become awakened. Daewon understands their concerns and promises to only take volunteers who want to be awakened, and for the rest, he's ready to make them stronger within a week's time. How is he going to do this? Well, he leads them to a building made of the horned beast horns, where all the clan leaders receive summons from the Tower of Nightmares. Daewon has managed to make the Tower of Nightmares. Somehow, all of the clan leaders are surely excited to break it, just like he did. All of the training is going to be held in this place, and since time there flows about 100 times slower than outside, it solves their time crunch problem. Now, they have two years of time to train. However, if their soul corruption goes past 80%, they'll be forced to log out immediately. Turns out that Jay Wan is not entirely a cold-hearted person. Only Kai Wan is still ready to be awakened, while the rest of them decide to train in order to increase their adapter level. The training starts, and Jay Wan is left it up to the clan leaders to be each other's teachers. 
The idea for them to learn each other's skills is quite extraordinary. However, all of them think that they are the strongest ones there, making them fight like children most of the time. Meanwhile, Daewon is training Kaiwan personally on the second floor of the tower, making him practice the same technique over a million times. He keeps motivating the clan leader because of his sheer willpower and praises him for being the strongest. It's nice for him to hear such words of praise from Jay Wan, so he agrees to practice the technique again as many times as his teacher tells him to. On the other hand, Sayola, the strong girl from the tournament, watches the Tower of Nightmares when Chungyo appears asking her what tricks she is up to. It looks like they know each other, as she asks him to come back and reveals that he is one of the people who planned for the great disappearance. Praise from Jay Wan, so he agrees to practice the technique again as many times as his teacher tells him to. On the other hand, Sayola, the strong girl from the tournament, watches the Tower of Nightmares when Chungyo appears asking her what tricks she is up to. It looks like they know each other, as she asks him to come back and reveals that he is one of the people who planned for the great disappearance. Chungyo is glad that he isn't working for the same inhumane people who made him watch the great disappearance while he did nothing. When Seolha tells him that many people still practice the techniques he taught to become awakened, it turns out that she is the second core captain of crack and has even surpassed the third stage of awakening while she shows him the scene of the great disappearance in her unique world. He watches a sea of blood filled with corpses while she tells him that nothing can be changed in chaos. However, Chungyo doesn't agree and tells her that chaos will definitely change this time around. She makes fun of him after hearing his foolish statements and is absolutely sure that he will fail just like he failed 900 years ago in chaos and 700 years ago in the Almighty Land when he ran away. Meanwhile, Kaiman is getting weak in the tower, which makes Jay Wan angry, who tells him to fight like he's going to die. He does use harsh words, but they work wonders as Kaiwan tries his hardest to channel all the power he has and achieves the moon eye. He finally does become stronger when Jay Wan congratulates him for reaching the third stage. His hard work has paid off, and no one looks happier than his teacher. A few days later at the fortress meeting, the Garuda fortress master, Dao Wida, Dong suggests that the Abyss Expedition Captain should be selected again after careful evaluation, to which Aisha Lindcroft, the Dryad Fortress Master, agrees as well. Of course, Jaywon is still in the tower with Kaiwan, so he isn't at the sudden meeting where his competency is being questioned. Of course, the loyal clan leaders of Jaywon are ready to fight to death against all the Fortress Masters since they do not want the Abyss Expedition Captain to be changed. It looks like Yu Yang is really going to fight the Garuda Fortress Master, Widong, making him amused and smug. Widong is even humble enough to let him make the first move. He does take the chance to attack him first, and indeed is really fast when he channels his lightning in the true lightning god style. Widong can't believe that this is the level of an early stage 7 adapter. Of course, Widong is a stage 8 adapter and doesn't believe that a kid like him can beat him, so he uses the Golden Meteor Chakram to beat him at last. Widong starts boasting about his victory Victory, but it's not over as Yu Yang stands up once again, declaring that this fight is not over yet. He starts showing off his tricks when Widong mocks him for only using his speed. However, he starts using Wang's 18 slashes to shut up the Garuda Fortress Master. Then he attacks him with Myun's 8 invisible traps, and it looks like all those training sessions in the ground are paying off. Widong can't believe that these clan leaders have taught each other their own techniques, so he gets serious as well. He launches a great attack to intimidate Yu Yang, who decides to stop fooling around and defeats him finally with Myung's secret technique. The match is over, so it's Maguk's turn to challenge one of the Fortress Masters. This is when Gyuk Rong also switches her side since she believes that the Fortress Masters have a higher chance at winning. However, the Jade Mask Golden Mark Bang Chan El is the one to challenge Maguk to fight who is the enemy of chaos that stole the fruits 900 years ago. He really shouldn't have dared to step in chaos again. Yanil reveals that he is working for the Monarch of Steel now, Hio Yu, and he clearly has a history with Maguk. The two frenemies are meeting each other after 900 years, and Maguk is really not happy to see him. While Maguk proceeds to attack Chianil with a lot of anger,
Order, he reveals that the monarchs are just giving all the fortress masters advice to make wiser decisions since the Gorgon Fortress has just been living in delusion. This is when the Emissary of Monarch of Steel appears behind Aisha, telling her that she shouldn't be swayed by Magook's allegations as J1 is more dangerous than the Forbidden Heaven Clan. J1 has been termed as a threat in chaos, which is a sign of hope and despair. She obviously can't let the same tragedy repeat itself, so she decides to work with the monarch. Back to the fight, Chianel is absolutely certain that Magook can't defeat him since their abilities are worlds apart and someone like Magook can't even put a scratch on him. Yuk Rong can also see that their Abyss expedition is doomed since they will have to fight against such powerful monarchs. However, Magook is not going to give up and picks himself up to keep fighting. He can't forget how the monarchs disgraced the Abyss expedition 900 years ago, so he keeps on fighting but is no match for Chianel. Of course, this is one Cayman appears on the ground, declaring that he will take over the fighting for now. Kaiwan tells everyone that Jaywan is busy with something, but it's quite unbelievable that he isn't there to fight for the Abyss expedition. Hopefully, Cayman will be able to save this hope for chaos. He tells Myun to evacuate everyone from the ground, since he wants to fight Chianel on his own. It turns out that Chianel also recognizes Cayman, who is ready to show his strength after getting all that training. The two start clashing, and Chianel soon finds out that Cayman is not here to play around, since he has learned some unique skills, which is the throw that he has practiced billions of times with Jay Wan. He promises to kill Chianel, showing him that he has become an awakened as well, catching him a bit off guard. Soon, he uses his strong thrust to bring the monarch to his knees and is about to finish off the fight when Gyuk Rong interrupts telling him to back off. She tells him that he can't defeat Chianel with just two years of training when Kamen reveals that he has actually trained for 200 years inside the tower and uses a killing blow to finally win the fight. Kaiman has gone to meet Aisha, the Dryad Fortress Master, who asks him if he is actually serious about fighting the monarchs. Hearing that he is indeed serious, she reveals that the Resurrection Palace isn't a children's playground, and defeating Chianel doesn't mean that he can defeat all the monarchs, who are much stronger than him. However, when he refuses to bow down to the monarchs, she is highly impressed by this change in him and decides to trust him as well. He shows her the Tower of Nightmares, making it obvious that he has become stronger after training in the tower. She can also see that Chaos is now able to stand up on its own strength, since the normal people are also willing to enter the tower now. Meanwhile, somewhere far away, Jaywon and Chungyo are having a discussion about the Fortress Master's meeting. It looks like Jaywon is confident that Kaiman has taken care of the situation with the opposing side. Chungyo knows that he isn't as strong as Jaywon since his awakening was based on just fighting against enemies. However, Jaywon's awakening led him to question his own existence. Jaywon reveals that he has trained in the tower for one thousand years now and is ready to go to the Resurrection Palace. His intention is to only get rid of the most powerful people in there, along with the stolen fruit and the treasure of the mares that turns living into the dead. However, in order to get to the Resurrection Palace, he has to pass through the Manticore Fortress, which is currently occupied by the Forbidden Heaven Clan. It looks like more badass fight scenes are coming our way. Chungyo doesn't look excited about having to fight the whole Manticore Forest alone with Jay Wan. Won't it be easier if they just sneaked around, but obviously Jaywon has made up his mind, as the members of the Forbidden Heaven clan inside the fortress are already charging at Jaywon and Chungyo with all their might. Meanwhile, Gleam watches everything on his little screen, and for the first time, he wants to believe the rumors that he's been hearing about Jaywon. No wonder Pitch Darkness wants him. This is when Sirens appears, trying to annoy Gleam with clothes that barely cover her body, but gets distracted by looking at Jaywon in action. She's kind of amazed to see everyone go flying away with his one strike. But back to business, she tells Lim that Chianel is in chaos, who killed all the forces sent to Garuda right before they were about to take over. Maybe he won over Garuda and Dryad after helping him out. It looks like the monarchs are wanting to interfere in chaos after all, and are launching a proxy war. However, Lim is really shocked when he gets to know that Chianel has been killed by Kaiman. Meanwhile, Jay Wan and Chungyo are done fighting with the clan's existing troops when a whole new troop appears in front 
front of them, led by Gorgon's previous righteous warrior, Heinz. It turns out that Chungyo refused to make him stronger a hundred years ago, when Gorgon was at war with one of the other clans of Chaos, which made him leave his old fortress. Now, he is the vice clan leader of the Forbidden Heaven clan and belongs to the Dead Demon Warriors. Heinz is ready to play along with Jaywon and attacks him with his secret technique, but of course, he is no match for the awakened Jaywon. That's how all of the warriors decide to attack together. While Leem watches his dead demon warriors being cut down so easily, his only option now is to attack Jay Wan with the rest of the dead demon warriors, since he believes he can surely defeat him as he's about to reach the level of the monarch. In the meantime, Jay Wan takes Heinz to his unique world, which makes him wonder if he would have been able to chase after the same dreams as him if he had continued his path as a righteous warrior. This is how Manicor's entire fortress gets split in two after Jay Wan touches them with his thrust, leaving just a few warriors left to fight with them. However, Siren appears in front of them, and Jay Wan finds out that she is a mare and is here to try and stop him on Lim's request. It turns out that Lim is on the verge of death inside the fortress after Jay Wan thrusted the building. Therefore, Siren is ready to forget about her promise to him if Jay Wan agrees to become her product. Of course, Jay Wan keeps attacking her and finds out that her spiritual power is really strong. Looking at his defiance, she decides to forcefully take him into his possession and uses her authority magic on him. Jay Wan keeps dodging her attacks while thinking that she can be of great help in their abyss expedition if she agrees to join them. There's no way she'd surrender though, so she takes him to the original eight gates of hell where they face off against each other. With every different gate, she keeps realizing that Jay Wan has a strength that no human can possibly possess. They soon reach the seventh gate, which is called Self Hell, where Jay Wan's main opponent is his own self. Jay Wan watches all the different versions of himself from different times in this hell and has the same techniques as him. It seems like they are as strong and as smart as him, so how is he going to defeat them? Having no choice, the original Jay Wan makes the first move and is glad to find that most of them only know his basic thrust, which is a little offensive to be honest. He is even taken to the memory from when he was about to enter the tower and sees how his superior kills all the commanders of their platoon because he was being harassed. Of course, Jay Wan was the only one in the unit who survived and was thrown into prison for 15 days as well. That was the day he actually started to hate the system that suppresses individuals. Suddenly, the faces of all the people he was once close to flashed before his eyes, so he ends up defeating his own self. He knows that this is truly hell where he has to kill himself to move forward, while Siren is quite surprised to watch him not lose out to his own ego. However, he doesn't stop at this stage and continues to the 8th gate, as he just wants to get out of this place. Opening the 8th gate, he finds no one waiting for him as a voice comes out introducing itself as Malark, who wants to narrate his story. On the other hand, Jay Wan and Siren are both unconscious in the real world, while the people of the Resurrection Palace, led by the hidden scent monarch Samyang Garam, are looking for them. It's getting quite difficult for poor old Chungyo to hide them, when thankfully Siren wakes up and with a snap of her finger, all three of them escape out of Manicor Fortress. This trick makes Sam Young even more desperate to find them. After escaping out in the desert, Chungyo reveals that he has sent a message to Gorgon where Kaiman is ready with his Liberation Army to strike the Resurrection Palace. They have an army of 300 awakened, which increases their odds of winning this time around. The army enters the Manicor Fortress to fight off against Sam Young and his forces, but the tide of war soon turns against them. Ten days later, Chiver is upset that they have lost five third stage awakened during the fight, which makes it harder for them to fight. To make matters worse, Sam Young and his forces are already at Gorgon's doorstep, wanting to continue the fight, demanding for Jay Wan's surrender and for the tower to be handed out to them. Aisha suggests that they should ask for the Steel Monarch, Yo Yu's help, but Kaiman denies her suggestion, saying that only Chaos should liberate Chaos. Meanwhile, Jay Wan is still in bed, completely unconscious. Chungyo is getting really irritated with Siren for making Jay Wan unconscious, and he is still not getting up even after 10 days. However, Siren reveals that if there's a human who passes through all the gates and arrives at the 8th gate, he might be able to become the King of Chaos. The 8th gate holds the legacy that her godfather left behind, when Jay Wan finally wakes up. 
Chungyo tells him everything that has happened over the 10 days, so Jaewon goes up to the meeting room himself. Everyone is quite happy to see him until he reveals that he is ready to go to the Resurrection Palace. No one likes his idea and wants to change his mind as they all think he's going to surrender himself. Of course, that's not Jaewon's intention, who reveals that his intention is to send them all flying away. All of them want to join him to destroy the Resurrection Palace, but he only wants four people in his little squad this time. He decides to take Chungyo, Kaiman, and Siren on this little adventure. Siren doesn't want to go with him, but Jaewon is not ready to read the room in this situation. He also tells the people that he is leaving behind to focus on their task of uniting their forces for more challenges. Of course, the monarchs might find another way to enter chaos after the narrow gate at the Resurrection Palace is destroyed, therefore they have to be prepared for every outcome. He also shuts up Siren by promising to tell her what he saw in the 8th gate if she comes with him, which is enough to make her agree. Jaewon and his little team are back at Siren's workshop, which is too pink, as they want to warp into the Resurrection Palace. She also shows them the tower that she's making, called the World After the End. Soon enough, they reach the Resurrection Palace after the warp is a success where the palace master god monarch, Hichtemeyer, looks quite miserable. He just wants the next monarch to die quickly and become the palace master so he can escape from there. This is when the palace doors are broken down by Jaewon's dream team, but it's actually Kaiman who goes in to face off against Hickmeyer this time, since he wants to get his payback from 900 years ago. Kaiman finds Hickmeyer really strong and starts believing that maybe he can't defeat him after all his training. However, Jaewon's belief in him makes him stronger and he starts to trust his senses. Meanwhile, Jaewon decides to take Siren to the Pleasure Palace, which is at the top of the palace, while Chungyo also faces off against the remaining monarchs. Inside the palace, the timid monarch Raika is having a little party with some other monarchs who aren't too worried about the situation outside. Raika is the only one who wants to go and check what is happening, however everyone else bullies him and mocks him for being a coward. In the end, Raika goes out alone to take a look promising to take revenge for being bullied by these arrogant monarchs. The monarch's party is interrupted by J1 and Siren, and he reveals that he is there to kill them all. Of course, the monarchs don't take a lowly soul of chaos like him too seriously. They decide to make him pay for ruining their entertainment and start attacking J1 consecutively, making it hard for him to dodge and cause some damage. Since it's hard for him to hit them individually, he promises to send them all flying away together, so he uses his technique quite confidently. However, for the first time ever, his confidence wavers a bit when he finds out that the monarchs are still standing intact in their place. The monarchs start mocking J1 for using such childish tricks on them, since they are a higher level than him. J1 really has to up his game to win now. The first Dragon Monarch's technique is too hard for Jaewon to break, and it takes a while for him to start attacking by concentrating on just one spot. This angers the Monarch even more, as it can prove to be dangerous for him. Finally, he uses his strong thrust to finally put an end to most of the Monarchs, leaving the first Monarch alive who promises to come back to kill Jaewon since Monarchs don't truly die as long as their bodies are connected to their minds and wake up in the Almighty World. But Jaewon decides to make them face true death by cutting off their link with the Almighty Land itself. The first monarch is truly scared as he is facing true death now and wants Jaewon to spare his life in return for anything he wants. Watching him beg is truly pathetic. On the other hand, Raika is seen peeking around like a rat and decides to report the incident to the Major General when Chungyo brings him to Jaewon. Simon has also been successful with his task and brings the palace master alive. Raika is really scared that Jaewon is going to kill him and begs him to spare his life. Shockingly, Jaewon decides to spare him as he wants to leave some witnesses. Furthermore, Raika tells him that the fruits are being stored in a vault which was made by a mare and generates passwords infinitely. This is when they need Siren, who unlocks the vault soon enough. They enter the vault and find the fruits that are almost running out, so Jaewon tells Kaiman to make the decision if he wants to take the fruit and go back to the living world. Kaiman has a choice in front of him, 
and he knows that he has suffered and fought for a long time, but he destroys the fruit because he feels that these ten fruits will become a seed of conflict and chaos, as people will fight to get their lives back. This is definitely a tough decision, but Jaywon knows that it needs to be done, so he allows Jaywon to destroy the rest of the fruits as well. This is when the Major General Storm Monarch, Kanael, barges in, threatening to kill them for touching the fruits. Magito, the Silence Monarch, and Samyung also arrive to gang up on them. Jaewon tells Siren to take away the unconscious Kaiman and Chungyo, and is ready to face the monarchs alone. Of course, they are much stronger than anyone else Jaewon has faced, and he finds a hard time trying to attack them at all. The three monarchs land several blows on Jaewon and are about to finish him off completely when he decides to fight back with all his might. Jaewon wants to get rid of the three monarchs while they underestimate his strength, so he starts using all of his force to fight them back, making Sam Young a bit impressed. It turns out that a long time ago, Amer went looking for the monarchs of the Twelve Regions until he reached Sam Young, asking for his strength in order to climb the illusion tree. Sam Young challenged him to a fight, and they fought for three days until he ended up acknowledging the strength of the mare. After that, the mare headed for the abyss, but disappeared after the monarch stole the fruits. Currently, Sam Young admits that J1 indeed is powerful, but he is able to block his attacks as well. He plays around with J1 for a while, making him too tired to stand up as well. In the end, he tells J1 to show him his true strength before he even speaks of the illusion tree. How will J1 react to Sam Young's challenge? Will he find out what J1 got to know in the eighth gate of hell? Will J1 actually win with these monarchs? What challenges await him when he finally goes on the abyss expedition? We can't wait to find out what chaos has in store for us. If you're a subscriber with notifications enabled, you'll find out soon enough too.